Okay, so the last week of new material, a week, a week from today, which is the last day of class, I'll, I'll try to sort of review everything briefly, touching on things that I care about the most, probably. Um, so we're, obviously I'm not gonna get to the end of the book. I'm, um, I, I, we're, we've lost a number of topics just for sheer time. So it is what it is. Uh, I'll, I'll finish up cameras today and hopefully get somewhat deep into optical communication and, and uh, recording. So where things stand with cameras, I, I, uh, the basic idea is pretty straightforward. I, I talked about this on Friday, that, that, that classic camera lenses use refraction to create real images of the scene in front of them. So they take the light that's coming to them from that scene, they bend the light so that light from any given point in the scene hits a certain point in the, in the real image. And you just put a, some sort of image sensing device in that, in the real image, something that knows what, what, whether light's hitting it or not, and you get an image, you, a, a photograph, a movie. Any questions about the basic idea of making a real, real image? It, it, I, again, it's, it's real because it, it's a pattern of light that you can put your hand in, you can put an image sensor in. And that's as opposed to a virtual image which forms, and I should say, real images always form on the far side of a lens. So that if the object's out here, I could turn them on. If the objects are, are out here, and the lens is this guy right here, the real image forms on the far side of the lens. Uh, we can look at that in a minute. That's as opposed to a virtual image. So this is, a, you're seeing a virtual image of me. The virtual image is forming on the same side of the lens as I am. It happens to be located, if you just sort of follow the, the, the bending of the light, light rays, it's located behind me, and it's an enlarged version of me. Uh, the other thing about real, uh, virtual images is, is they're upright, so that I'm not standing on my head here, to, to your view. You, it, this is just a magnifying glass, right? And I'm having fun, but um, the, the image is upright. My, my head's obviously <laughs> on top when I'm live, and I, it's on top when it's in the virtual image, so it's, it's not flipped. That's in contrast to the, to, the virtual, to the real images, which are flipped upside down, and that they're, by some measure, they're flipped left to right as well. It depends on sort of how you look at it, the left-right thing, but it's certainly upside down. Is that okay? <sighs> Having said that, then, there are some, some other final, sort of final issues to talk about with, with cameras. Uh, one of them is that not all lenses are identical, and they come often in telephoto or wide angle and everything in between. So if you've ever um, taken photography more seriously in a cell phone, you'll, you'll discover that, that uh, there, are, there, are, there are lenses that, that effectively concentrate on a very small part of the scene in front of them and, and, make, and blow that up to large size optically. It's not a digital process at all. It's, it's rather the, the image is, is large compared to other, uh, that formed by other lenses. On the other hand, there are also lenses that form very small images and therefore collect uh, a, a, a scene that's very broad and manage to put the whole scene on the image sensor and build the whole scene into the, into the photograph. And just uh, by long-standing sort of convention, the ones that sort of zoom in on the distant objects are called telephoto lenses. And the ones that, that capture the entire scene in front of you are called the wide-angle lenses. And how do they differ? Well, those two differ in their fo the focal length of the lens. And uh, to give you an idea, let me, let me show you these, these two effects, and then we can come back to this image. I, actually, I can leave this up here. I, I'll put the, I'll let us look through the lens over there on the side. Does it work? Yay, okay. So we're looking through this camera at, at the real image projected on that ground glass screen. And right now, you're looking at the image of these three distant objects, you know, the, the, the lights. As we saw last time, you can only really focus on one at a time because distance does matter. So here now, I've got it focused on the tall filament. If I to focus on a more distant object like the, the, the little ball compact fluorescent, I have to move the lens 
closer to, uh, farther, sorry, farther from the screen and to focus on the very nearby circle, I have to move the lens farther from the screen. And that all had to do with how the, how the rays coming from those objects are diverging when they enter the lens. The nearer the object is to the lens, the more its rays are diverging, the harder it is for the lens to bring those rays together, the farther beyond the lens that the real image forms. So I was just playing around with this and trying to get the three things to focus. Hopefully you can sort of rediscover for yourself why the nearer objects put, their, put, the, ob put the image farther from the, from the lens. Um, thinking after class, I don't, I don't have to do that. Okay, so this is a, this is a 30 centimeter focal length lens. What's a, what, what does focal length mean? Well, as we'll see, the focal length of a lens, it tells you how far be, beyond the lens an image forms for an object that's very far away, like the moon. In principle, as far away as, you know, infinitely far away. Um, these objects actually, for all practical purposes, are already pretty nearly infinitely far away. They're, you know, five meters away. It's, that's big compared to this distance. And so the image forms about 30 centimeters after the lens. That's what, it's, it's, it is a 30 centimeter focal length lens. In fact, because these objects are a little closer than the moon, the lens struggles a little bit in trying to bring their rays together. And so the images form a little farther than 30 centimeters from the lens. 30 centimeters is kind of as close as you can ever get when you're working with the rays that are the easiest to focus, those being the ones that have come from the moon. It's OK? So this is a 30 centimeter lens. It creates images that are the size you're seeing them right now, just, so just sort of to remember a little bit how big those images are. If I replace this lens by a much shorter focal length lens, here's a, here's a 10 centimeter lens. We'll go seriously short. If I put it over here, I got to bring this up a bit. There. Looks pretty crummy. Why so crummy? Why am I seeing two of them? I seem to be seeing a reflection off the table. One of them's a reflection. But the images, okay, apart from the fact the images are crummy because these are very simple lenses, the images are forming much closer to the lens. It's, this is a 10 centimeter lens, focal length. It's, it's a third the focal length. And so the images form much closer to the lens. They're also much smaller. You see, they're, they're about a third the size. And one other thing about it is they're much brighter. Why brighter? Because the lens is the same size and diameter as the 30 centimeter lens. They're, they're both an inch and a half ish in diameter. So all the light that was present before is, is in, this, in the image is still present in the image. But it's concentrated into a smaller area, so it's brighter. Is that okay with everybody? This is effectively a, a tele, ah, uh, why they think first, wide angle lens. Why? It's creating a small image. If, this, if our image sensor were the size of the screen, we would, we would see not only all the lights, but everything I'm probably all the way out to here if I were, let's, you, know, you can see me over here flashing the light at it, right? So we, we can, I can come all the way out here and still be in the image. Um, so it's gathering a wide field of view in contrast to the long lens, long focal length lens, which is a telephoto. It makes a much bigger, much dimmer image, but there's not so much field of view. Can we see me at all here? I have to come in pretty tight here before you can start to see me. It's just, it's narrowed in on the center of the, of the scene in front of the lens. So bottom line is, telephoto lenses, the ones that, that 
concentrate on a small part of the scene in front of them and blow it up to large size. They're long focal length lenses. The image forms far beyond the lens. Uh, the lens typically has, if it's a camera lens and you want to protect the path from the lens itself to the, to the image sensor, you need a long tube. So when you've watched people at a sports event with a lens that looks like a, a bazooka, I don't know, a giant thing out here, that's a long focal length lens. It is a telephoto lens. It is projecting its image very far beyond the, uh, the, the, phys the physical lens itself. It takes a long distance for the, for the light rays to come together and form the image. To do that, the telephoto lens bends the rays gently. It does not try to bring them together to, a, to meet up uh, close to the lens. It does a gentle job and lets them come, come together way far beyond the lens to form a giant image. So if you remember the question I asked you the other day, actually I'll ask it. And, and I, I don't believe I answered this question. Oh, I think I did answer the question, yeah. But I'll ask it to you again anyway because no one will remember. If you want to change the camera's lens to make a distant object appear large in the photographs, telephoto lens, what do you do to the lens to do this? You okay with the question? How many think you increase the diameter of the lens to make the, the image bigger? How about decrease the diameter of the lens? How about increase the curvature of the lens so it's more like a ball of glass? And finally, how about decrease the curvature of the lens? Yay, it is decrease the curvature of the lens. The telephoto lenses are, th are typically thinner. They don't look like a Coke bottle lenses. They're, they're thin to the point, sometimes when you look at them, you can't tell that they're focusing at all. They gently bring the light together. It takes a long distance, for, again, for it to come together to make the image. The image is giant. Uh, the, gym, the image corresponding, however, is, is dim. So how do you fix that? How, dimness means that the image sensor may struggle to get enough light to record in a photograph. So how do you compensate? Make the lens also large in diameter. So it's gently curved and large in diameter, so it collects enough light to make a bright image that the sensor can deal with. So that's the reason why when you see, again, the sports, sports events, not only do they have a lens that's quite long to be a telephoto lens, but it's also quite large in diameter to collect enough light. OK. Um, I can go back then to this, this observation here with, the, with the, what's called the lens equation. It's sort of a remarkably simple, although it, it's got divisions in it, but it's a remarkably simple relationship between three distances. One of them is the distance between the lens and the object. It's called the object distance, just to give it a name. The image distance is the distance between the lens and where the image forms. So, so here's the object distance from, the, from my candle to the lens. The image distance is from the lens to the image of the candle. And it turns out, it sort of just falls out from, the from a simple calculation having to do with how lenses work, which we won't do, of course, um, the, de the calculation, that, that th the sum of those two uh, re reciprocals is the reciprocal of the focal length. So focal length is a characteristic of the lens itself. When you buy the lens, it has a certain focal length. Uh, and if you know what the object distance is, and you know the focal length, you can calculate what, where the image forms and, or any other possible arrangement of this. Um, you, to, just to point one special case out, if the object is super distant, like the moon, that object distance is so big, it's this one over that huge distance just goes away, it's zero. So really, the image distance and the, and the focal length are the same. That's, that's what, I, what I claimed was true, that, that if, you, if you take a very distant object, like like the lights in the back of the room, and you figure out where the image of those lights in the back of the room. Can I, can I, I'm actually getting images of the projector. There are two dots here. Those are the projectors um, lighting. They're pretty far away, and they're forming a nice round image on this screen I'm holding here. I don't know whether all of you can see it, but is it okay? You can see the dot, the dots? Here, here are the room lights forming images. And they're the projector screen for me. The distance now between this lens and the, the, the paper screen I'm, I'm holding there, which is about two feet, that's the focal length of this lens, about a two-foot lens. Okay? And having, 
once I know the focal length is two feet, and it's this, you know, give me an object distance, I can give you an image distance. Works out pretty well. Any questions about that, that relationship? It's just a, you know, it is useful in calculating where, the, where to look for the image if you ever need to. Uh, mostly I care in this context that you understand how a telephoto lens works and how a wide angle lens works. You okay with that? Um, already asked that question. Okay, so, so a, a, few, a few tidbits about fancier lenses. You're sort of used to just being able to point and shoot and not worry about any details beyond that. There are some details that if you ever get involved in, in more serious photography, you might well care about. And so with fancier lenses, they often have built into them apertures. That is, they, they have the ability to shrink the effective diameter of the lens. The lens, you know, manufacture, this lens obviously collects an awful lot of light. It's got a huge diameter. This will form a nice image, but the image will be, be very picky about focus. Because if you're using rays that went through the center of the lens, the middle part, the edges, all those rays, trying to get them all together at once is tough. And if the distance of, to the object changes even by a little bit, they won't all come together in the real image at the same distance as they did before, and you have to focus again. So focus becomes critical in, diameter, in, le in lenses that have a large effective diameter. So what's the alternative? Well, if you go to a smaller and smaller diameter lens, <coughs> the focus becomes less and less critical, and you can get a larger depth of focus or depth of field. That is, things that are not actually at the same distance from the lens will simultaneously all appear to be in focus. In principle, they're not quite in focus, but they're, but they're all, for all practical purposes, they're in focus. Uh, is that okay? So by shrinking the diameter of the lens, you can get more depth of focus, uh, by enlarging the, the diameter lens, you can get less depth of focus. Why would you care one versus the other? Well, if you're taking a picture of, a, of all your friends in front of the mountains, you probably want your friends to be in focus and the mountains to be in focus. So you might well want to use a small aperture in your, in your camera. And even, even pretty simple cameras these days secretly have the ability to, to, to change the effective diameter of the lens, and they can pull this stunt off. So when you, when you take, if you've got a, any option, in this, there's a setting like for, for scenery setting, typically it's a little mountain. Um, what you're doing is you're saying, camera, please use a relatively narrow aperture. And I, told, I showed you last time, what it, the apertures often look like, like a device like this. I guess, uh, let me look, I'll show you, look down on this for a second. Camera. Yeah, so, here, so here's an aperture, and th this is the smallest it can go, and this is the biggest it can go. And so by shrinking down the aperture in your camera, it gives you better depth of field. It brings, brings your friends, the garden in front of the friends, the mountain way back in the distance, everything's in focus. So that's obviously desirable for scenery shots. On the other extreme is suppose you're taking a portrait of somebody and you want the person to be in focus and you want the background to be all fuzzy. It's a very common way of taking a portrait. You don't really want to have this, the distraction of all that stuff behind the person. And in which case you use the largest diameter lens you can. You open the aperture up wide and you might even, if you've got the opportunity to change lenses, you go to a lens that's extremely big in diameter. Might cost a fortune, but, it's, but portrait lenses often do. Because they're very big in diameter, they focus, they're exquisitely sensitive to focus. You've got to focus on the person. Um, some of the lenses are so, so crazy sensitive that you know, their, their nose will be in focus and their, and their cheeks won't be. You've got to be a little, it's, it's, you can get that, to that extreme if you want to. But anyway, a lot of portrait photographs, I make it go surf the web and find these things, will deliberately use a large effective diameter of the lens. Okay? The measure of sort of how large a diameter the lens is, uh, actually what, what matters is not just the diameter of the lens, but the diameter of the lens as compared to the focal length of the lens. If a large diameter of the lens that has a long focal length, that's, it's, it still might um, 
get a pretty good depth of focus. A small diameter lens and a small focal length same, might be the same thing. They sort of scale together. So there is a quantity known as F number. And let me get the F number right. It is the focal length divided by the diameter of the lens, or the effective diameter of the lens. That's the F number. And it, it gives you two useful, it, it provides two useful pieces of information. For, for lenses that all have the same F number, regardless of their focal length, if you divide, the, if you take the, the, the length, the focal length of the lens divided by its diameter, if it's four, for example, you'll get the same brightness of the image and you'll get the same depth of, of focus approximately. If you go to a F number uh, 16, they seem to go in powers of two. Um, if you go to F number 16, that is a long, fo that, that means the focal length is much longer than the diameter of the lens. It's, it's a tiny little lens compared to the focal length. You get Tremendous depth of focus. Everything's in focus. The mountains, the, the, the butterfly going a foot in front of the camera, it's all in focus. The image is dim, however. Is that okay? On the other hand, if you have F1.2 or 1, one's tough. One's tough to get. One means that you divide the focal length by the diameter of the lens and you get one, that's a big diameter lens. So there are lenses, they probably they exist some ones, but that's that's rare. 1.2 is not, not rare. Um, that has very little depth of focus. That's a, that, you know, for portraits and stuff. Okay? Anything else I want to tell you about F number? Um, I just, that if you go to a high F number, which means that you're using a, a sm it's got a small diameter compared to its focal length, the image is dim. You probably need a long exposure to get enough light to hit the sensor for the sensor to go, yeah, yeah, I see this. The sensors have gotten more sophisticated, more light sensitive as the time has gone by, and so that often, it, that's less critical than it used to be in the days of film, where you really had to be picked. The film's pretty picky. You want to get the right amount of light on it, more or less is bad news. So, so you were very careful back in the day, if you were going to use a high F number, which doesn't collect much light, you had to use a long exposure. And that has its own consequences. Sometimes it means the motion is blurred. If you, watch, if you take a photograph of people running by you with a, with a high F number, they smear across the screen and across the picture. Um, your cameras now, a lot of these are so automated that you just don't even notice this is happening. But you, do, but you often do at least have the opportunity to suggest to your, to your camera or your gadget. So, so keep in mind that if you want to take a portrait of somebody, you probably want to suggest if the camera's capable of it, open its aperture up, Let, use the whole lens. Blur out the background. And if you were taking a picture of a mountain scene, you know, some scene where you want everything to be sharp and clear, go to a small F number. You know, coax it that direction. Small aperture meaning high F number. Any questions? All right. Um, two more things to talk about before I finish. Is, is, is these lenses, as you're seeing, these lenses are, I'm going to turn this off because it's of seeing it. These lenses are very simple spherical lenses. Spherical meaning that they're sliced right out of a, they're, they're effectively sliced out of, a, out of spheres of various sizes, of spheres of glass. Of course, they're, they're cut off and, and, and slapped together, but, but they have, the surfaces themselves are spherical in shape. Spherical lenses are very easy in principle to, to, to prepare. People know how to do these hundreds of years ago. You, you basically make the, make the lens and you rock it back and forth. You cut it roughly and then you rock it back and forth in a polishing system. And it's just, it's just moving through the spherical, the, the spherical surface being all spherical the same way, rocks back and forth nicely in, a, 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 in the opposite part of the sphere and polishes beautifully. So it's, it's very simple to make. However, spherical lenses are imperfect. They, the, the images they form are not, per, they're not perfect. You can see that. Um, they were sharp toward the center, maybe, but the edges get real fuzzy and, and irregular. So these are problems. Sphere, you know, they got names, spherical aberration, and so on. Um, there are fancier lens structures, some of which are, are called aspheric which try to, to, to do better than spherical lenses, just to get started. So, so some of the things that you, can, that you can play with to make better lenses. I mean, the first one I'll, I'll mention in a second, the idea that you can get an adjustable focal length. Uh, so you can get a lens that 
can, can vary from telephoto in character to wide angle in character and everything in between. That's pretty convenient. That's now pretty common. Um, another problem with these simple lenses that are made of one piece of glass is that they have color problems. They have, dispersion shows up, right? In any transparent material, the, the classic transparent materials, the blues travel slower than the reds. And they bend differently, and they get separated. So these lenses that are, have only one piece of glass, they don't, bring, they don't focus the red at the same place they focus the blue. And that's, so dispersion plays, uh, there's a chromatic aberration. So to fix that, the, 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 the simplest and the classic approach is to use two different kinds of glass and to make a lens out of two pieces glued together. It's called an acromat. And there's a way of, of using one of the materials with, with a certain dispersion character to compensate for the dispersion in the other material. So two lenses together, you get one, one lens. Of course, it's much more complicated to make and to, to assemble, but you get no color problems or, or negligible color problems. And so this is, this is crucial to photography once you get well, you, color or otherwise. You, you get crummy images if you, don't use, if you try to use a single piece of glass. Um, there are glasses that have less dispersion problem than others, and those are very expensive uh, glasses. Um, the, the L series lenses, sometimes when you see people wandering around with, with fancy cameras and the lens is, instead of being black, it is beige. The beige lens, the beige, you know, you can, th that's a badge of honor to have that or, or a, you know, a, to, to loft, you know, to, you know, I'm, I'm special, ha ha, I've got, a, I've got a beige L series lens. Those are low dispersion glass. So they're getting better color, uh, color properties and they want to make sure you know that. Okay, and then they paid $2,000 for their lens, that kind of stuff. Okay, so dispersion is a problem. I should say that everything I'm telling you about cameras shows up also, and I told you last time it was in your eyes. Your eyes behave, have all these, these features in them. Tel uh, telescopes do as well. So the McCormick Telescope, the McCormick Observatory, is it, the main lens of that, of that observatory. Is, it's just a, a great big lens with a, with a focal length of, I don't know, five meters or something like that. I haven't seen it for a number of years. I can't remember how long the focal length is. It's projecting a, it's like super telephoto lens, right? It's just projecting a really big image. And you can either project that right onto a plate of uh, photographic film or a sensor, or you can inspect that image with a, mag with a mic magnifying glass. And the eyepiece is a, essentially a magnifying glass to look at the real image. So that's what, a, that's what typical telescopes are. And it, in this respect, so, so the, the, the the lens up there projects the real image, which is inverted, incidentally, and you take your eyepiece and you inspect it, that image, up close and personal. If you take the eyepiece out, you can put photographic film in there. Same idea. So far, so good? The, the lens up there is like, it's like this big in diameter. It's, a, it's an acromat. It's two lenses glued together to get rid of the color problem. And, and that's why, during the, during the era when that, when that McCormick Observatory was created, and the, the telescopes were like that, these were, these were essentially lifetime projects to make a lens like that. Make one perfect achromat lens was like someone's, someone's uh, life's work. Uh, partly just to get the glass that clear and that clean without stresses and, and structural bubbles, no bubbles, and stuff. to get that clean, and then to polish it perfectly enough to get a really good, uh, real image and have two of these. You, didn't, you don't make one lens. You make two lenses and glue them together as a sandwich out of two different materials. Super hard work. Um, anyway, that was, that, that, that's the uh, astronomy back in the 19th century. All right? What are the details here? Oh, anti-reflection coatings. These are important not only to camera lenses, but to, to a lot of uh, eyeglasses. If any of you have eyeglasses, you probably have had the option of, do you want any reflection coating or not? Well, you know, what's this about? Gla glass and plastic surfaces reflect a couple percent of the light that hits them, right? Well, for eyeglasses, you, uh, to some extent, you can, you can see whether somebody's got an, just a simple uh, surface on their eyeglasses or whether they have some, something special on them by how much light shines off them the extent of the reflection. And for eyeglasses, the reflections are not such a big deal. 
uh, one of the issues with reflections for, for the wear of the glasses is light that comes in hits once and bounces off and, and, and dazzles the people walking by. Who cares? But light that comes in hits the back surface of the glasses and then and bounce and reflects and then reflects off the front surface. So it's a double reflection. In, out. That light goes back into your eye and it's, and it's annoying. So you, 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 the sun is coming up here, ding, 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 it's bouncing, and you, you see extra, extra features in your field of vision that you don't really want. What's the solution? The solution is to apply a coating to the surface that uses, that either, there, 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 there's a, the simple and the fancy anti-reflection coating. The simplest anti-reflection coating is to apply to the, to, the, to the outside and inside surface of the glasses a layer that reduces the change in speed of the light. So, so light, the light encounters that, that, that thin surface and it slows down a little. And then it goes through that thin surface and enters the glass and slows down a little. That process, that go, instead of going from the speed in air to the speed in, in plastic or glass, it has this intermediate. And that actually reduces the reflection considerably. So that's the simple way of, of reducing the, the reflection. Just put, use a material that's got an intermediate index of refraction. The problem with that is it, it, that's limited. It's not super, super good. And the other thing is the materials that are like that are often pretty soft and easy to scratch. Magnesium fluoride is one of them that, 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 that can be used, but it's not very good for, you wouldn't necessarily want the surface of your glasses like that because you can't clean them very well. So what's the fancy way to do it? The fancy way to do it is to, is to put a f series of layers of transparent material on your glasses that use interference to kill off the reflections. So that there are all those surfaces, I don't know how many they need these days, um, but they manage to make it so that, that light across most of the visible spectrum fails to reflect because it interferes with itself. The reflections, the partial reflections interfere with one another and result in no reflection or nearly no reflection. And that's the, that's the current standard, you know, state of the art uh, for, for eyeglasses and it's also the state of the art for for photographic lenses. Photographic lenses often have a, a half a dozen, a dozen, two dozen surfaces inside. Lots of possibilities for reflection, which I'll come to in a second. And the result is that you really got to suppress reflections from all these surfaces. Otherwise, you got light rattling around the lens that, just, that shows up in a non-imaging way on the, on the image sensor. It just, they just fogs out the whole image. It causes trouble. The blacks aren't black, the, the whites aren't white. So um, they use essentially this oil films effects, these oil film interference effects to kill off the reflection. And you can see this in, in your camera lenses, if you've got, you know, they're, they're big enough, or eyeglasses, there, there's, a purple, there's a purple look to the light bouncing off the glasses. My, mine actually, they have exactly that purple look that I'm claiming because they are anti-reflection coated. So, I'm, so light's coming in, it's, it's the whole white. The only thing that's really reflecting off at an angle is the violet end of the spectrum. And you can see that on, on, a, on a decent sized quality camera lens, all that, that purple character to it. But by and large, no, no light reflects. So, so my, my glasses, you're not getting flashes of light off my glasses because of the, the reflection off those front surfaces is a tenth of a percent or something like that. It's way, way down from the four that it would be if it were just glass. I always chuckle at old movies where they would have a, the actor who did not need glasses or, or refused to admit that they needed glasses would have glasses with a flat plate of glass in them. And you would occasionally see as somebody's turning along, you'd see just this bright flash of light from a, you know, the sun over there. They'd just turn along, you get, you get a perfect bounce off this flat mirror surface. You know, ha, 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 that, they're not wearing glasses. Uh, they don't need glasses. Yeah, anyway. You okay with this so far? Other things about the fancy lens, to get really good images, again, one spherical lens won't cut it, even an acromat won't cut it usually, so they use multiple lenses to sort of fix all the little imaging problems. I should say multiple elements, I think is the proper name for it. It's one lens composed of many elements, and I said this is one of the reasons why you need the annual reflection coating is because if you're going to put five elements into the lens, you better not have a lot of light bouncing back and forth. So they're all anti-reflection coated, but they're all in there for a purpose to try to uh, 
perfect the imaging effect process. Your, your cell phone cameras do an amazing job of forming images. They are, they're actually quite high tech. They're made really inexpensively. They are, they are not just simple spherical lenses. They are totally engineered. I think they're, are they one, one element? I'm not, sure that, I'm not sure how many elements are in the, uh, in the lenses. They are, of course, very small in diameter, so they're not working with a lot of glass. But, and they have very short focal lengths. The whole thing takes place in a tiny, tiny little uh, structure. But they form kind of amazing images. Uh, but that's what happens when you, you if you're going to make 100 million of something, you can really engineer the bejeebers out of it. And they do. OK, well, that's probably good enough here. So that's the story of camera lenses. Um, one last thing to talk about, and then I'll leave cameras, and that is zoom lenses. A zoom lens effectively uh, changes the focal length, its focal length. And it can go from being a, a telephoto lens that zooms in, you can zoom back to wide angle and, and capture a much larger scene. And the simplest, the conventional approach to doing this involves three real images. And the idea is that you use a bunch of elements. In principle, you need three elements to do this. In practice, it's probably more than three elements, because each one might be, is, is, is probably an acromat at the very least. You, you, you have the, first, the first lens element forms a real image of the object. And the real image is a pattern in space where you can touch it if you wanted to, but they don't, they don't, nobody touches it. It just sits there in empty space, and it acts as the object for a second element, which forms a second real image. And finally, that second real image acts as the object for the third and final element, which forms yet a third real image on the image sensor. So it's, it's just a series of, of um, oh, there's, a, there's a word I was looking for where, where the, the image is being projected one after the next and the next. The value of this approach is you have the, the positions of these two early lenses uh, control, the, one, the first one controls the focus. It, 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 moving this guy around moves around where this real image forms and ultimately where, whether this, this final real image is, is in focus. So that's the main, the main point, is moving this first lens element allows you to focus the, focus the lens. And a lot of zoom lenses, if you've got a big fancy camera zoom lens, the focusing control is, 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 right, is at the end of the lens chain. It's, 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 it's on the part closest to the person you're taking a picture of. Sure enough, so you're moving that element in and out to get focus. The middle element has this interesting feature that as you move it back and forth, you change the relative sizes of these two, the, 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 the first real image and the second real image. The, the closer this intermediate element is to the initial object, well, to, well, to, the, to the, the, the earlier, I'll call it candle, the bigger the second candle becomes. And the second, the second image. So moving this element back and forth zooms changes the size, finally, of the, of the final real image formed on the sensor. So this is the zoom in, zoom out motion. Shoving this guy forward makes the, uh, what, what shows up on the image sensor bigger. Shoving it backward makes up what shows up on the image sensor smaller. The details, do I care that you remember it? Not a bit. But, but you just can understand that this, this motion, these motions within this, these collections of, of lens elements allow you to, to, to change the size of the final real image hitting the image sensor and therefore make the, the lens effectively telephoto if, it, if the image is blown up big or wide angle if the image is blown down small. Okay? And that's what you're, when you're playing with the, the zoom feature on your camera or your zoom feature on your video camera, all that, or just the, it's not so much in your cell, cell phones because your cell phones don't have this, the zoom real, maybe some of them do. I've never seen one that has a real zoom, an optical zoom. It's digital zoom, which is cheating. That just takes the middle of the picture and just makes it big and, and grainy. Is this true? Does anybody, does anybody have an optical zoom on their camera, on their cell phone? No, okay. But, but certainly like video cameras do. 
they'll you know, 60x optical zoom. You know, you, you can zoom in and you can get a fly in the back wall. Um, you usually give up some resolution for that kind of crazy zoom. There are lenses that you can buy from, again, the, you know, the L series lenses, these $2,000 lenses or $5,000. Some of those ones, are, they, they have amazing optical range and it's sharp as a tack the whole way. So that's, uh, that's impressive, but you pay for it. Any questions about cameras? I'm just gonna leave cameras then. We're done? Okay. So. Optical recording and communication. So yet again, we can use, use light to do something interesting. And this time, instead of, instead of forming images and, then, and recording them the way a camera does, we can record data or we can pass data along. And part of the story here is the whole idea of you know, what, what are you passing along? What do you mean passing along data? So optical recording. Um, I'm going to skip that. What I'm going to go after are these things. Ooh, ooh. Um, so optical discs, they can record an awful lot of stuff. Um, CDs, DVDs, Blu-ray discs. These become less interesting to you all as streaming gets more widespread. But, but still, you guys still use recording discs anymore? Anybody, do you guys use them? I guess sort of, <laughs> maybe. It's kind of amazing what goes on. I should talk about vinyl. You know, they're coming back. Vinyl records. Woo! I used to do that actually. Okay, so and and uh, and cassette tapes. I never did eight-track tapes. That was even bef you know I wouldn't say it was before my time. It was definitely before I taught about these things. Okay, but optical optical discs still they still have some value. They can store an awful lot of information and they play it back perfectly. Uh, so part of this is just really related to the idea that. The television 50 years ago was imperfect. Not only did it not have amazing resolution, but it had noise to it. So if you look, and you've seen this in movies, if nothing else, you, you, if you looked at old television images, or, you, or actually, you, you still see the old television recordings showing up in, in the, the coverage of, of some event during the 60s. It's got a lot of noise to it. Visual noise. What's visual noise? I mean, it's the, it, not only do you have not have wonderful resolution, where you've got billions of pixels, but you've got um, random randomness of, of color and brightness thrown in, overlaid over the material that you can't you can't see it. Um, so that see it well. Um, you guys missed all the fun of things like in the days of broadcast television, the old the old world. Uh, when, a, when a airplane would fly overhead and reflect the wave back at you, you get partial wave stuff, you get inter interference effects. Um, it's all gone, you know. Those used to show up as ghost images on the television. So, you, so you'd see Walter Cronkite there giving his, uh, telling you the news here, and about an inch to his right would be a ghost Walter Cronkite, the reflection off the, tel off the, the, the airplane, giving you the news also. So that, you know, you missed it. Ha, huh, too bad. Um, so um, I'll talk about, to some extent, the, what, what's happened to all this, this way of presenting audio or video or everything else. And let me just, let me just go right into the issue of, of, of digital transmission, because this is sort of the, the central thing. If, you, if you've, hopefully you've wondered what's the difference between analog and digital. You've heard so much about digital. Um, analog, you've probably heard of. Um, what's the difference? And I, you know, you can I can categorize things like, like the old vinyl records were totally analog, and old television was totally analog. Modern television and modern music, your, the MP3s or the streaming from, pick your favorite streaming, Spotify, Pandora, whatever, um, totally digital. You know, what's the difference? So, so if I if I succeed in passing on nothing else, let me let me try to give you a, a, an understanding of analog versus digital. So, any of these, I'll pick music to start with. Music is is of course is sound, and you can convey, you can record or transmit in some. You can send sound uh, as a, as 
by, by, to start with, you measure the air pressure, say at the, at the singer's, near the singer's mouth. Uh, the, the fluctuations in air pressure are the sound. That's what you hear with your ears. So far so good? Okay, so a microphone senses those sound pressure variations. Uh, it creates an electric current that's proportional to the pressure fluctuations away from, from the ambient. The pressure goes high, the electric current goes strongly in one direction. The pressure goes low, quite low, the current goes strongly the other direction. So there, that current now is representing the, the sound. It's not literally sound. It's a current. It's electricity, not sound. But there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between pressure, which is a physical quantity, and current in the wire, which is a physical quantity. And whether it's current or voltage doesn't make a lot of difference. The story is about the same. Is that OK so far? So the current is representing sound in an analog fashion. Uh, analog means that you have, you have one physical quantity representing another physical quantity. One to one, perfect. So more current represents more, high, more pressure. Less current represents less pressure, and so on. They go up and down together. Is that all right, right so far? So analog representation, you're using, you're using a single physical quantity. And in the wire coming out of the microphone where you've really got a lot, you can really sort of protect the current from any trouble, this is just fine. You can, you can, you can convey the sound beautifully as this current and not worry too much. But if you continue to try to, to, to convey the sound for example, you, now you put in, you use a radio wave to represent the current, so the, which represents the sound. So now the radio wave is representing the, the sound. And now you're sending it out in the great wide world as a broadcast. So the radio waves say it's amplitude. We've talked about amplitude modulation. The amplitude now of the wave is representing the amount of current, which is representing the pressure. And so the amplitude of the wave is giving you all the information you need to know to recreate the sound, and your receiver will do that. But any junk that shows up because somebody's running their lawnmower or because uh, there's a lightning storm or something like that, anything that shows up that's indistinguishable from this transmitted AM transmitted transmission, uh, electromagnetic wave, uh, confuses your receiver. It can't tell the difference. And so noise begins to appear in the sound. It cannot perfectly distinguish the, the, the electromagnetic wave that's supposed to be representing the sound in an analog fashion still, and other stuff that's just showing up that, that, that wasn't, no, no one asked for, it, that's coming about because of random noise, noise issues. And so to, to, to give you a, just a more specific example of an analog representation, if, if I wanted to represent air pressure by the height of my hand, this would be an analog representation of air pressure. And we could, we could make the, the bench zero. So this is, this is ambient pressure. And during a, a silent period of, of the music, this is where, the, where, where my hand would be, representing no sound pressure. And then I'd go up and down and up and down like this, right? This would be high pressure, low pressure. I'm making very low frequency sound. If I go faster, I'm, making higher, I'm representing higher frequency sound. But this is an analog representation. One physical quantity, the height of my hand, representing another physical quantity, the air pressure in the sound. Well, this is OK as long as um, there's no noise around. What would noise be? Well, suppose there were a whole flock of birds flying through this room, and you couldn't see where my hand was very accurately. You couldn't recreate the sound very accurately. So analogs, or, or, the, or the lights were turned off, or, or I was dizzy and I'm having trouble keeping my hand under control. Okay? So analog is very susceptible to noise. You can't distinguish the original physical quantity from any junk that gets thrown in on top of the physical quantity. What's the alternative? The alternative is a digital representation. And digits somehow sounds like decimal and so on. It doesn't, it's not really about that. It's, the digits are symbols. What you're doing is you're sending information as a series of symbols. And the symbols can represent anything you like. 
They could, for example, they could represent just the letters of the alphabet by Morse code. That's perfectly good, digital transmission. Or they could represent music as a long series of measurements of the sound pressure written out in decimal form as, as, the, as the pressure to 10 digits around the, uh, the ambient pressure. And when, there's, when, when you're using symbols, you're using many physical quantities to represent a single physical quantity. And so, so here, you, know, you can see this. To, even, in the, even if there were some birds flying through the room, you could still see this and would know it's a seven, I hope. You can see that, right? OK. Um, you know, here's a five. Even if I take the five and I step on it a couple times and get it all dirty, as long as you can still see it's a five, we've lost no information. So, so digital transmission says, don't use this one physical quantity to represent one physical quantity. It's too susceptible to, to imperfections in the, in the production, the transmission, all that stuff. Too much noise sensitivity. Use symbols. And just keep flashing symbol after symbol. As long as the person at the, at the far end can, can read that symbol, even if it's somewhat flawed, all the information is getting across. 100%, exactly 100%. And you just need a lot of symbols to, to represent the sound from uh, uh, your favorite music track. It's a lot of symbols, but, but, but no, there's no loss along the path. As long as, as long as you can read the whole way through, it's perfect. And that's, so that's the digital transmission concept. And I'll do more of this on Wednesday.